Oh my god. Your car is screwed. G'day, Dylan O'Donnell here. Uh, if you've been on this channel for a while, you know I like my telescopes thick. And it is a common criticism that I am really out of reach of most beginner astronomers and most astronomers doing this from their backyards. Uh, you may feel that I am flexing on you. And you would be right, I am flexing on you. But that's because I can. I mean, even if you drive a Beetle at home, it doesn't mean you don't like jumping on YouTube and seeing what people driving Lambos do. <laughs> Now, before we get started, uh, I should warn you, you shouldn't do this. And I don't mean because it's dangerous and you might hurt yourself and you shouldn't do this at home or whatever. I mean, getting into astrophotography is a bottomless pit. And once you go down that rabbit hole, there is no turning back. Let me give you an example. Here's a famous astrophotographer before he ever discovered astrophotography. And here he is today. Astrophotography, not even once. So today I'm gonna go back to my roots. I'm gonna show you from the start, simply how to connect a camera to a telescope. But before I do that, I'm gonna go through the basis and the context of this, why we photograph space, how it all began. I'm gonna give you a crash course on the history of astrophotography. My name is Dylan O'Donnell and you're watching Star Stuff. In the beginning, there were no telescopes, there weren't cameras, there were just people looking at the sky and recording star positions manually. Hipparchus, Tycho, Ullagbeg, Galileo, and many others. The accuracy of their star catalogues, let's be honest, was pretty bad. And they used basic observatory markings on walls and tools like that to record their positions. Verbant and Gent in 2012 compared the catalogues from Ptolemaeus and Alagba, and while admirably good for their time, they found that the average error in each of the star positions were anywhere between 22 and 150 arc minutes of error. That's a lot of error. Galileo, like many astronomers, used drawings to record star positions and the surface of the moon, which are of historical value to us, but as Coppole in his 1969 paper noted, none of the formations depicted on his drawings can safely be identified with any known lunar objects. That's quite a burn. Maybe Galileo is just a terrible drawer. To illustrate this point, I've overlaid one of Galileo's drawings of star positions with one from a modern day catalogue. And you can see for yourself how badly the star positions are depicted. They're sort of in the ballpark, but a lot of them are pretty far out. But by modern standards, this data is not very useful to us at all. If we're gonna use this information for something like calculating stellar distance, we need to record stellar parallax. And in the pre-photographic days, the error was measured in arc minutes. And the star with the largest parallax, or the closest star to us, Proxima Centauri, has a parallax of 0.76 arc seconds, not minutes. So we need to wait until photography makes its debut onto the scientific arena in order to have sub arc second measurements in order to make things like stellar parallax measurement possible at all. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Dylan, you said you'd help me put a camera on a telescope and I'll get there. But I just want you to know that this is a revolutionary act. This is something we've only been able to do in a very short moment in history. So just forget about instant gratification for a second. It just The term photography itself was actually invented or coined by an astronomer, John Herschel. As photographers or astrophotographers, we literally are light writers or light painters. And John Herschel coined this term shortly after Degas invented the process in 1839. Louis Degas patented the daguerreotype. He patented the process in 1839, exposing light for the first time onto an emulsion of silvered copper plate, which was immediately recognized as being applicable to lunar cartography by mathematician and astronomer Francois Arago. After some experimentation with chemicals to improve the sensitivity of the process, after Degas himself failed to capture the moon, John William Draper succeeded, and his image is widely considered to be the first astrophotograph. It's on exhibition in New York 
at least sometimes. I think it's in the archives there, so they might pull it out now and then. The photographer had to track the moon manually for a whole 20 minutes to get one exposure. That's massive. Even seasoned astrophotographers like myself today, we rarely go up to 20 minute exposures because it's just so long and it's such a pain in the butt. You get a gust of wind or anything and your exposure is ruined. Uh, but he persisted, John William Draper persisted at this and he did successfully expose the moon. By 1872, Henry Draper, who's actually John Draper's son, had not only taken many of the first generation of stellar photographs, but had successfully photographed the spectrum of Vega. It's important to remember at this time, cameras and photographs weren't as sensitive as the human eye. It was far easier to do a lot of these measurements by eye. Uh, we take it for granted now, of course, because you can hold your smartphone up to the moon and take a photo in a fraction of a second. And it probably even looks better than John Draper's 20 minute exposure of the moon. But persisting with long exposures and tracking made revealing nebulosity difficult, but possible. Astronomer Andrew Ainsley eventually succeeded with a revealing image of M42 Orion. Of course, it's Orion. It's the first beginner nebula that we all head to. For this, he was awarded the gold medal of the Royal Astronomical Society. Despite the lack of sensitivity, astrophotography was able to dramatically further scientific measurement and research in several ways. Firstly, by methodically cataloging the sky to record star positions with certainty. Secondly, by allowing a record of solar eclipses beyond their momentary phenomena. And thirdly, by recording and analyzing stellar spectra for which chemistry, temperature, and mass could be derived, a process which began with astronomers like Margaret and William Huggins, but blossomed under Harvard College Observatory's Edward Pickering and his team of female research assistants. Photography yielded so much data so quickly, it became almost impossible for the amateur working alone to compete with the well-staffed professional observatory. This all sets the stage for a huge paradigm shift, not just in photography, but in science as a whole, and our understanding of the entire cosmos. Of course, Albert Einstein comes onto the stage. At the time, his theory of special relativity allowed him to formulate its first experimental prediction, a prediction that would not be possible without astrophotography. The prediction described by Einstein was that a ray of light going past the sun would undergo a deflection of 0.83 seconds of arc. If you were able to get a photo of the star field during a solar eclipse, you'd be able to see if the stars around the perimeter of the sun actually get warped by the star's gravitational influence on space-time. And it was achieved eight years later in 1919. Arthur Eddington organized two teams. The Brazil team captured 16 images of the solar eclipse through thin cloud and sent the plates back to England for developing an analysis. Not only was the starlight deflected, but by the exact amount he predicted. Photography and astrophotography was fundamental to this experiment which changed the course of scientific history. Even during the space program, we still had to send up chemical cameras. The lunar orbiter camera in the late 1960s would actually develop film chemically while in orbit around the moon and use an analog scanner to transmit the images back to Earth. Essentially, they faxed a copy of a photo they developed in space back to Earth. Willard Boyle and Georgie e. Smith of Bell Labs would go on to invent the first imaging semiconductor or CCD charged coupled device and they won a Nobel Prize for this in 2009. Kodak Eastman would eventually develop the experimental digital cameras using CCDs. Shortly after NASA would employ these CCD sensors in a huge number of space missions. Since the 1990s the Hubble Space Telescope has been utilizing filter-based approach to color imaging from its monochromatic CCD based sensors and has produced iconic images of views within and beyond our solar system that have captured the imagination of the general public as well as opening a completely new era in astronomical observation. Other missions like Gaia and Kepler which all rely on photographic technology serve to greatly advance our understanding of the formation and, and evolution of the planetary system. At the time of filming this video the Vera Rubin Observatory formerly known as the Large Synoptic Sky Survey Telescope is dusting off the sensor on the largest highest resolution camera ever invented and this should be able to scrape up a huge amount of the sky. It is true that some of these larger surveys are taking away from the amateurs where the amateurs used to fill in the blind spots because there were so many of us around the world with our little telescopes and our little cameras who could fill in the blank. That's not to say that this isn't an important endeavor anyway. Now we know how you got here I do think it's time to put a camera on your telescope 
throw that eyepiece away and actually do some astrophotography. Your bank balance and your family may probably regret it, but don't say I didn't warn you. Now you may not have the biggest and best telescope in the world. You may have something small like this. This is just a five inch Celestron Schmidt Cassegrain telescope. Even if you have a kid's telescope like this, it's still something that you can do photography with. Now the easiest and cheapest way to start with astrophotography, I really think a little camera like this, it looks like a little plug, uh, but the QHY 462C, it's a color camera. It's small, you're not gonna get great nebulas with it, but you will get the planets, you will get the moon, you'll be able to do the sun, all of that sort of stuff. So you just unscrew the eyepiece, whack that in, plug this to the computer, and you're done. But if you're like me, you probably already have a camera. So if you already have a DSLR camera, it's worthwhile investing in three small things, three small adapters to actually get this bad boy connected to the telescope. So you're gonna need one of these adapters for your particular camera body. I've got a Canon EF. This allows me to unscrew the lens, put this on instead, and it gives me this nice thread here, which we need for the telescope. The other one I use is the T adapter. This gets you the back focal space, but it also connects straight to this. So this now becomes how I attach straight to the back of the telescope, which I'll show you in a sec. If you don't want to pull out the star diagonal, you can use this guy instead. I can now attach the cannon onto that and slip that straight into the star diagonal. See, now I could just drop this in, have my camera sitting here, but I just don't like doing that. We're adding in another mirror here and that will degrade the speed of your image. It will degrade the image as a whole. So I prefer to take all of this off and attach the camera straight to the back of the telescope. Now I'm gonna pull this one off completely to get to the rear cell. Screw that in. And now I can screw this straight to the back. And that is ready to go. I'm ready to go look at space or take it while watching or just look at the girl next door. It's really up to you. I hope you enjoyed that episode of Star Stuff. It was probably way too long for what I wanted to explain, simply connecting a camera to a telescope. However, I think it pays to know the full context of how we got here in the first place and the amazing science behind this backyard hobby. But remember, everything is meaningless and we're all going to die.